I want to speak to you today on the delicate subject of divorce. Not a divorce between a husband and wife that occurs in a home, not that. But a divorce that occurs in the life of a believer between the truth that is heard but is not lived. This radical separation between the truth and the life. The reason for this divorce is not relational incompatibility. No. It is a matter of personal inconsistency that is carried out in public for all to see and for most to question. A.W. Tozer, in his fine, penetrating book, The Root of the Righteous, writes about this tragic divorce. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. It, it is the glaring disparity between theology and practice among professing Christians. So wide is the gulf that separates theory from practice in the church that an inquiring stranger who chances upon both would scarcely dream that there was any relation between them. An intelligent observer of our human scene who heard the Sunday morning sermon and later watched the Sunday afternoon conduct of those who had heard it would conclude that he has been examining two distinct and contrary religions. It appears that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right but are not willing to endure the inconvenience of being right. So the divorce between theory and practice becomes permanent. Truth sits forsaken and grieves till her professed followers come home for a brief visit but she sees them depart again when the bills come due. No issue is of greater concern to James than this one. That's the reason he wrote his letter. He cares greatly that we do more than hear and understand the truth. That's only the first part. He's equally concerned that we live clean lives following the hearing. As we get into verses 19 through 27, he underscores that theme several different ways. I provided you with an outline that leaves some blank spaces. Forgive me if that's too elementary for you, but I've learned over the years that if we can insert words every now and then, it will, it will perk us up, keep us on target, and help us understand what seems significant in the mind of the writer of Scripture. I'll begin with three initial observations that emerge right out of the chute at the early part of verse 19. The truth, as it appears in this passage, falls into three categories. First, it is imperative truth. Imperative. Understand this, exclamation point. Your Bible may read, know this. We would say, pay attention. Sit up and listen. This is important. Nothing I'm going to share is insignificant. 
This is imperative that you get it. So it's imperative truth. I notice, secondly, that it is also family truth. As you read verse 19, you come across family terms, brothers and sisters. Those are family words. We're in a family, the family of God. So this tells me James is not writing to the one who is lost spiritually. He's writing to believers, fellow brothers and sisters in the family. If you're lost, you can't pull this off. You, you, you may want to, you may try, but it's all futile effort. It won't last, and it won't be authentic. This is for family members who have the Spirit of God at work within us. So, brothers and sisters, this is for us. Let me say thirdly, this is also universal truth. See the word all in verse 19? You must all be. And then he gives us some direction following that. A-L-L, -L, written to all of us. That means this is written to you, this is written to me. This is not written uh, to your husband or your wife, your son, your mom or dad, your friend who may have brought you to church, or your uh, former mate, or the person at work. This is to you, this is to me. So I would say, take every bit of it personally. None of it is irrelevant. All of it is important to each one of us, brothers and sisters, as we look into this imperative truth. If I may borrow from the word I used earlier, James counsels us on how to keep from being divorced, how to keep the scriptural truth from being disconnected from our activities in life. So all the way through, you will see him emphasizing that. Now, he begins with some specific instructions. I love the way this passage unfolds. You can read it for yourself and pull much of the same thing all on your own. First, he talks about preparing for the truth. We don't just sit down and immediately plunge into truth. We need to be prepared for it. Some things we need to do, some ways we need to think, some disciplines we need to apply. I find four of them mentioned in verses 19 through 21. Look with me. So this is imperative truth for family members, every one of us. To begin with, you began by having a listening ear. It all starts there. The simplest, easiest, and most common way of absorbing truth from God is to hear it. Just simply hear it. I stand corrected. We need to listen to it. When I am hunting and I have someone with me and I think I hear in the distance what we're hunting for, I'll say, shh, listen, listen. I'm not saying simply hear this. I'm saying listen carefully. Listen. That's the term used. Be quick to listen. Since we're limiting this to our time together on a Sunday morning, though our time in God's Word is certainly not limited to this hour, but since we're limiting it to this place where we gather for worship, let me urge you not to be hard of listening. You may hear very well, but you may not be listening. Listen to words, to implications, to illustrations. Picture them in your mind. 
That's why the second step is so valuable. A controlled tongue. See it for yourself. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. I never learn anything while I'm talking. I learn when I listen. So do you. Many of you are very good listeners. There are some people on our staff who are very good listeners. And when we gather, you can tell when you're with them, they're not waiting to interrupt you with their comment. They're listening. Even if it means pausing as you pause, they let the silence be. I think sometimes in moments of silence, we learn more than in times when words are spoken. For we're framing the words in our minds. A controlled tongue also means I am not ready to blame anyone else. I'm setting aside all excuses. I, I'm, I'm not going to sit in the presence of God as his word is being declared and argue with him. No, my mouth is closed. I'm going to take it in. Listening leads to learning. And as I stay silent, God invades the secret world of my life, and we all have them. Secret worlds. Things in our lives, not even our closest partners in life and friends in life know anything about. That's where sin plays its games on us. That's where motives hide. That's where the reality of who we really are takes shape. That's where we really, as we call it, make up our minds. So we're having listening ears and we're coming with a controlled tongue. And now third, he adds, slow to get angry. Isn't it beautiful how you can work your way right through the verses, right through the words, and it falls together in a logical manner? Now we come to the issue of anger. Why would he mention that? Well, because the great tendency on all our parts when the Lord gets very specific, perhaps speaking through a pastor or through a person who's teaching a class or simply through the words of Scripture, our tendency is to resist. Maybe get a little huffy. A little defensive. You don't understand everything. Wait. You're talking to the Lord God who misses nothing. Let me show you that, lest we pass it too quickly. Hold your place. Go to the book just before James. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to turn to one of our favorite verses, and then we're going to address one that very few people go on to read. I'm referring to Hebrews 4. Verse 12, one of our favorites, and verse 13, one of the least known, though they go together. Look at these two verses. Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting, look at this analogy, Cutting between soul and spirit, I often say, where no surgeon's scalpel can even reach. No surgeon ever does surgery on the soul. Only God does that. And he does it through the word of truth. As I'm speaking, I'm reaching an area no physician could ever touch in your life or in mine. His word has a way of getting in there deeply between joint and marrow. It, look at this. It exposes our innermost thoughts. See the word exposes? It is the Greek word kritikos. 
kritikos. You guess what it's from, what we get our English word from. It, it, it is the word critic. You can read it here. It is a critic of the thoughts, innermost thoughts and desires. Isn't that the truth? When you get into God's word, your innermost thoughts are exposed. And where they're wrong, they're revealed as wrong. Now, the tendency on our part is to resist that, to get angry. I mean, what right do you have to mention that? God has every right. Well, does he really know? Look at the next verse. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Beautiful statement. Tough to imagine. But there is no secret before him. Nothing hidden. All things are open and laid bare, as he uses it here, laid naked before him. Now, back to our James statement in 1 verse 19, or, or 1 verse 20. Uh, slow to get angry, for human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. When you're angry, righteousness is never the result. That is anger in the wrong sense. So he says, now we're ready for the next step. Get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. So now we come to the place of receiving the truth. Receiving it. Back to verse 21. We are to humbly accept the word God has planted in us or it has the power to deliver our souls, to save our souls. Look at the attitude. It's, it reads humble. Nothing to defend, nothing to prove, not attempting to impress, just Willing to accept. And that next word, accept the word, is the word for welcoming. Think of it this way. Every time you are opening God's word, you are laying the welcome mat out before your heart. Lord, I welcome you to come into my life in any area you wish to address. I invite you to do so. Not only on the Lord's day, but every day. And I come before you as an open book. That's why we say to people, always bring your Bible when you come for worship. Always be ready to open it and lay a welcome mat out, imaginary though it is, because the term except is dripping with hospitality is saying come in come on in please uh, don't bother to knock I invite you to look over any and every part of my life you see the value of, of this as it relates to the issue of hypocrisy Hypocrisy looks like it's interested, but it isn't about to change. It, uh, it is in a rut. And anger helps keep you there. It resists change. But when you lay down your arms and you calm your spirit, you're saying, welcome, I'm inviting you to come and take charge Show me what you need to show me. Now, in the verses that follow, I find one command, two options, and three applications. And you will see them. I 
I haven't dreamed them up. They're all right here. The first of two options is that, or the first command, I should say, is that we be a doer, not just a hearer. And that is James's message. It's in verse 22. Don't just listen to God's word. You must be doing what it says. Otherwise, you're, you're only fooling yourselves. So our desire is to hear what he's saying with a view toward doing as he directs. Now he explains that even further. Gives us two options. The first is to be a forgetful hearer. And he uses a wonderful, very practical illustration. For, he says in verse 23, if you listen to the word and don't obey, here's the first option, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. Now, uh, stop right there. I know by looking at you that every one of us has looked in a mirror before we came together. I know that because I see myself in a mirror right after I get up in the morning, and it's frightening. <laughs> it's frightening. I don't know how it happens. I can even comb my hair before I go to bed. But when I check in the morning, click the light on, and look, it is like the explosion of a mattress has happened on my scalp. <laughs> and I go, whoa. I mean, I got to, I, I don't just turn the light off and say, well, I'm ready for church. Get my coat on. Get myself ready. You don't want to see me right after I got up. Ask Cynthia. And I will often, without her even seeing me, start to work on my face. Takes a while. Some things you can't change. <laughs> uh, most of it you can't change. But you can do something about your hair. So I'll start on my hair. And uh, it takes a while. And uh, sometimes it doesn't cooperate. You've learned that. Uh, some days are bad hair days. And I don't know why that is. But no matter how much stickum you put on it, <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> and or, or your teeth. After breakfast, you don't want to see what my teeth look like because I haven't cleaned them yet. I haven't brushed them, so I brush them, make sure nothing is dangling <laughs> or stuck. You don't need to see, oh, you had a little eggs and maybe some lettuce for breakfast there. And you don't need to know that. Why? Because I've done something about looking in a mirror. But if I don't care, the glancing into a mirror is a joke. I'm just looking to frighten people. I check. I go, yeah, that'll, that'll wake them up. And... I show up looking just like I did when I got up. I am a forgetful hearer. You see, we're not talking about mirrors in the bathroom. This is the greatest mirror God ever made available to us. He gave it to us. In a language we speak, in print we can read, in words we can understand, right there, every bit of it. And as you see it, it's like looking into a mirror. Now, if you're the first option, you're on your way to a divorce. There'll soon be a radical separation between what it says and how you live. Because you don't care. No, no, you don't. If you did, you'd listen. You'd control your tongue. You'd stop the anger. You'd open your heart and welcome it, saying, come on in, whatever it takes. I need attention. But the forgetful hearer doesn't do that. 
He glances or she glances and then walks away with no plans to change, quickly forgetting and only fooling ourselves. We've exposed ourselves to what is really there and with a shrug, lights out and we go right on living. However, there's a better option. Look at verse 25. But, it's a word of contrast. If you look carefully into that law, that means God's word, that sets you free. And if you do, there's James's favorite term again. If you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. So, Here's an obedient doer, not a forgetful hearer. This obedient doer, doer looks carefully, gets up close to the mirror, pays attention to details. Wait, I got to go back over this. I'm going to make sure I see what it says. Oh, man. That's my problem. And it exposes it. No one else is able to do that because no one knows you like God does. And so he writes in his word what you need to see. And when your heart is ready, when your mouth is closed, when your ears are open, and your will is, uh, is, uh, op is welcoming the truth, he says he promises to bless us for doing it. Isn't it interesting that uh, when we look carefully back to our mirror in the bathroom and, and we get everything all pretty well ready and we forgot the back of our hair. You ever done that? Of course you have. I frequently do that. So that's why God gave me a wife who is a very careful student of the back of my hair. She'll say, honey, wait a minute, you're not, you're not ready yet. She'll say, just look. So it takes another mirror, and I've got to go like this. And I don't really know why that's important, because I don't preach like this. <laughs> and no one is up here. So what does it matter? It's distracting. It's not a complete job. And sometimes I, I really have to work at that. I got a little cow lick right here that has never laid down even since I was four. It's always stood up. She will often say, uh, you need to check the back. Oh, okay, okay. And I'll get the back like this. Go, How's that? Well, that's better. And I, You didn't know I'd go through all of that before. Why? Because I care that nothing be distracted. You don't need to be distracted by me when we've got a clear mirror to pay attention to. Nor do I. You need to be preoccupied with something that's out of sort. I, I'm, I'm in as great a need as you are. People often say, how do you know what to preach on? I preach on what I need to hear, and I'll let you listen in. That's as good answer as I can ever give. What you're hearing today is what God would have me hear. I'm in as great a need as you are. I, I, I'm prone to anger just like you are. I'm prone to talk too much just like you are. I'm prone not to listen as well as I should just like you are. So we're all in this together. But if I want to be a faithful, obedient follower, a doer, I will look carefully I will make plans to do what it says, meaning what? I've got to do something about that. Because, listen to me, this doesn't have the power to change me. It only reveals what I need to change. This is only a mirror. No mirror ever prepared me for the day. I have to do the preparation. So I, I, I have to think honestly. Was I a little sharp with one of the kids yesterday? Did I embarrass one of our grandchildren when we were together? 
Did I speak too quickly when I was with a friend? Uh, is my driving getting out of control so that I'm really getting impatient? I don't know about you, but there are too many red lights. <laughs> at, at least that's, my problem is I got cops listening to me right now over here, so <laughs> I've got to be careful. I don't mean there are too many. I mean they're, they're irksome. <laughs> that's all. We need them. They just last too long. And, and I think, well, <laughs> I can uh, fudge on this. I mean, it, it's pink, right? <laughs> it, no, it's red. Stop. Now, I, I don't always have the other driver in the car with me who, uh, <laughs> I'm going to really stop right there because <laughs> I, I really want her to ride home with me. So <laughs> it's amazing how I can rationalize around it. I'm in a hurry. I've got an important thing I've got to get to. People are waiting. The problem was I left too late. I didn't plan well. It's not the light's fault. It's my impatience. And on and on and on I could go confessing to you what you can't do anything about. I've got to deal with it. You know why I know to deal with it? Because God's Word talks to me a lot about patience. Talks directly to me. I need to pay attention to it. Hopefully I'm more patient than I was when I was younger but sometimes I wonder if I am. It bothers me. You see, uh, the, God's mirror doesn't make me patient. I make myself patient by the discipline of self-control. Same with you. I control where I look, and therefore I don't, my eyes don't get me into trouble. Now, look at the application. There are three of them. It's so beautiful. Verse 26. Here we go. First application. If you want to be a person who doesn't divorce himself or herself from truth, keep your tongue under control. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Look at the verse. You don't need a preacher to tell you what it means. If you're living with an uncontrolled tongue, your religion is a joke. People who hear you running off at the mouth or saying things you shouldn't say, cursing in a moment of anger, don't try to talk to them about Jesus. You're talking like they've been talking all their lives. There's no difference. The difference is when tough things happen and you don't curse. And they notice. Because you've got your tongue under control. It's a lifetime job. That's why James keeps coming back to it and keeps coming back to it. Let me tell you, uh, no extra charge for this comment. If I could control one thing in this church, it would be everybody's tongue. I'd start with mine. But I can't control it. Spirit of God has to control it. But if our tongues were all under control as they should be, the testimony of this church would be worldwide. Be like no other church that's ever existed. You ever been to Stonebriar? That's a church that does not gossip. That's a church that does not curse others. That's a church that says kind things. That's a church that speaks God's truth. That's a church that seeks apology and forgiveness when they've done wrong. They, they're, the, they're under the control of the Spirit of God there. That's what he's talking about. So if you want to have a real, the, the, the real genuine faith, start with that muscle in your mouth. Start there. There's another test. Read on. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God 
means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. You have a heart of compassion. You can't just walk past someone in need. I mean real need. I'm so pleased when Valentine's comes, we always have a little gathering for our, our widows, and the, the room is often packed with those who have lost their, their mates in life. And it's, it's wonderful to see the spirit there as the staff serves them, and, and they all feel loved, cared for, not overlooked, not forgotten. That's genuine, authentic Christianity. We don't do it to make a, most of you didn't even know we had that ministry. Most of you don't know what ministries we have. Because you simply come, sit, listen, and leave. But if you want to be involved in church life, you're involved in the details of the family life. Part of it is to what we do for those special need children, what we do for widows, what we do for starving children, how we get involved in the lives of those in our community who don't have enough to even feed their children lunch. So we get involved in that because that's genuine faith in Christ. And there's one more. You refuse to let the world corrupt you. You have a life that refuses to adapt to the culture. You're not carrying big signs and flags and yelling at everybody because they don't do this or don't do that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about living above the culture, living beyond the savagery of our time. We behave ourselves. We keep ourselves pure from a world that's lost its way. Let me tell you a quick story, and I'm through. Uh, when I was at Dallas Seminary, I took a wonderful four-year graduate course in theology. And there were other things besides theology, but that, that was the driving engine. And uh, the courses were life-changing, except for one. I've, only, I, I've never shared this publicly. It wasn't because of a bad professor. It wasn't because of an irrelevant subject that was being taught. Uh, it, it wasn't because of fellow students that made it a bad course, no. I audited the course only course I've ever audited. To audit a course means you attend the course, but you don't receive any academic credit. So I didn't have to take notes. I didn't have to pay attention. I wasn't involved in the give and take. Uh, I didn't do the projects, and I didn't take exams. I didn't get a grade. It's as though I never even took the course on my final uh, record. I audited the course. Had I taken the course seriously, like everybody else, I would not have forgotten many of the things in it. But because I audited, I kind of hung out in the back, uh, sometime left a little early. I wasn't, didn't have that much commitment to it because it was just, a place to get some information, which I, by the way, quickly forgot because I hadn't put anything into it. You know what occurred to me when I was finishing my message? Too many people audit church. You don't have any plans to change, many of you. You're the same you were 10 years ago. If not that, you're worse. If you were hard to get along with then, you're even harder now. Why? Not because you haven't been exposed to the mirror. You just haven't done anything about it. Because you don't care. Now, there are others of you who care very much, and you're different people today. Because you decided one day, through whatever may have been the circumstance, I'm not going to audit church anymore. This is too important. I'm going to sing those songs with passion. I'm going to pay attention to what I'm singing. I'm going to listen when the truth is open. I'm going to turn to God's word, and I'm going to make it a study 
sometime during my week, I'm going to remember, I'm going to address things in my life that need attention. I'm going to keep a journal on things that need to be addressed because my life is out of line and I need to bring it in line to please my heavenly father. Not so I'll go to heaven. Christ took care of my going to heaven when he died for me and I believed in him. But I want to, I want to live on this earth in a way that impacts others' lives, not confuses them or makes them think, why do I want to do that? Look at I, I, he's no living no different than I live. But when we don't audit the Christian life, it's amazing how different we become in a matter of time. And we look back and we realize God's grace has really come to my rescue here, there, and there. So grateful I'm not divorced from his truth. I'm so grateful that when I open his word, I want to fall on my knees and humble myself before it because this is alive and powerful and sharp, penetrating, changing. It is. All of it. Bow your heads, will you please? I'm closing abruptly on purpose because I want you to think about what you've heard. I want to suggest that you change your habit. That you decide today is going to be the first day of the rest of your life, which in fact it is. And you're no longer going to just go through the motions of coming, sitting, listening, and leaving, and continuing to live like you've always lived. It's going to make a difference in the way you think, how you react, how you treat people, how you respond. In other words, the truth is now going to penetrate because you're now dissatisfied with the radical separation between you and what you know to be the right way to live. You're going to stop all the auditing. You're going to take the course, which is a lifetime course of walking with God. And he will very graciously lead you in ways you just right now I can't imagine and he will give you the strength to change in areas that you've never changed in before and you'll look back and say you know God is faithful as of that day things were different and if for you coming to Christ is the answer then come to Christ you've heard the gospel you know Jesus has died for you Believe him. Trust in him. Place yourself at the foot of the cross and give your life to Christ. Begin the journey of the Christian life seriously and sincerely. You'll be amazed what a difference it'll make in the rest of your years on this earth. So come to him today. Dear Father, thank you for speaking to us in ways that we cannot miss it. You've, you've, not, you've, you've not stumbled, you've, you've, you've not stammered or stuttered. Your word is truth, and we get it. We can see the value of living it. So give us, give us, we pray, listening ears, closed mouths, 
open hearts, a calm spirit, a willingness to change. Start today. I pray for those who've never trusted in your son that you'd give them a misery like they've never known until they turn to him and finally discover what peace is all about. Minister, we pray in your, your own way during these closing moments as we, in the tenderness of this hour, commit ourselves to you, never again to audit our time with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Good. Amen. Yeah.